The best piece of advice that I received that I didn't take was once when an executive said to me, Michael, you think too much with your heart as opposed to your head. And listen, my mother told me that I had a big heart and that I was selfless when I was a little boy. So you can imagine having someone tell me not to use my heart uh, didn't sit well with me. So that's a piece of advice that I received but didn't take because I think it takes the heart and head to do anything in life. Uh, without that, you can't be passionate, you can't have empathy, uh, you can't see the other person. Uh, and so I, 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 when, I, when I heard that, I was dumbfounded. I paused for a second. I didn't give any feedback to the person, but I just went on living my life by using my heart, as my mother said to me, it's a gift. You know, things that have prepared me to live this uninterrupted life really just sort of uh, started really just on that journey, you know, taking the first step leaving home uh, without any fear or trepidation. Uh, took on the assignments, uh, saw myself doing things uh, that you know people would have said was impossible for a kid from Brooklyn with a single mother. Uh, but I set out to prove them wrong because I always knew I had God on my side. I grew up in the church, my mother uh, insisted, uh, and it always bothered me. Why do I have to do this? But uh, later on in life, I realized I needed something to lean on and something to carry me in all the different places that I've been. You know, we're people who uh, really assimilate to just about anything that's who we are as, a, as people. But I think for me, um, you know, growing up in New York City, I had a lot of exposure to a lot of different people. So it wasn't just segmented to the community in which I lived. I was out of that community because of all the jobs that I had uh, as a teenage kid, which my pastor saw to. He just didn't allow us to be idle. So that exposure to people as a salesperson, as a messenger, I mean, there was a whole litany of things that I had done uh, as a teenager, working in places that you probably wouldn't have gotten a job had it not been for my pastor. So I would say, you know, uh, ju just those steps were ordered for me uh, and it allowed me to sort of move uh, in the way that I needed to, but also it allowed me to dream and have a vision for my life. And so I would say one of the things that you want to do is if you're working with a large retailer or whoever you're working with, your merchant, your buyer, uh, is to understand when they begin to make their plans and then be a part of that planning session, right? So that you can come along with them and they're not fitting you in uh, like a book wedge, if you will. But you're part of that strategic plan, especially if you're integral to the category. And I think knowing your partners, developing a relationship is critically important. But you also should know your category. So you should know when people are buying. You should know what the buying cycles are. That's part of preparation. It's key to know your business. And, 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 and that's whether you're selling a product or if you're providing a service to uh, a customer, is to know your business, know the cycles, and uh, you'll always be prepared. Yeah, one of the most important steps in terms of my leadership style that I would say would be to provide a platform for people. Uh, you're only as good as the people that work with you, around you, for you, however you'd like to position that, but I think providing a platform for them to grow. Um, I prided myself in making sure that the teams knew that uh, I trusted them. And even if a mistake happened, you know, we work through that. I'd always say, listen, just don't make the same mistake. Those, because we'll make mistakes because we need to try things. But I think, uh, if anything, as I came through the ranks, I had a lot of leaders who were insecure. And so, in a lot of rooms where I felt like I should have been, I, I wasn't allowed to be. And I thought, you know, when I'm managing people one day, one thing I won't do is to thwart their creativity nor their energy. And that I would make sure that I would put them in front of the right people, places, atmosphere, moment, so that they could shine. Because through them, I shined. And uh, I would tell you that uh, I've just never forgotten that. So 
you know, one of my favorite quotes, uh, Maya Angelou, you know, people don't remember what you said or did, but they remember how you made them feel. And so I remember how I felt when I didn't get those opportunities. So I made sure that I extended those opportunities to the people and teams that I work with. Yeah, yeah, I would say when I think about leadership positions and people who I've put in place, I mean, you know, it, it all boils down to the interview, right? And, and it also uh, is a little bit about, you know, keeping your eye out for good talent as well. And so I've always been a good listener uh, and I've always been able to compliment people who have done a great job or provide constructive criticism. Uh, it was done for me a long time ago by some leaders, which was very valuable. And when people are responsive to that, then you know that they're open and they're willing to grow uh, as you would lead them to, especially when they're new in their careers. And so I would say that I've had a lot of successful people in, in this business who are still in this business after all of these years and love the business. I, I made them love it. They became uh, purposeful. They found their purpose, if, if you will. And most of that is really how you impact other people. But on the other hand, I've made some tough decisions as well. Uh, and, it, and it's because of my vulnerability that those things happen, but you have to be somewhat vulnerable. And, and sometimes mistakes happen, you pick the wrong person, but what you have to do is be able to quickly pivot and make a change so that you don't affect the sum of a, of a team, if you will. And so I think uh, both those things, uh, you know, I'm proud of, but I'm proud of the discernment that I have to quickly understand if I've made the wrong decision. Uh, and I'm willing to give a, a second try, uh, but I don't go beyond that. When I think about sort of tips, if you will, when I think about that, I think one thing, and I've said this for many, many years in my career, in order to prepare for a one hour meeting, you need to do a hundred hours of research. And I don't care what business that is. And so when you're working with a large corporate companies, Fortune 500, 1000, it's about preparation. And that hundred hours, you need to really understand the companies that you're pursuing, the category that you want to enter, or in fact, what service can you provide to a corporation to help them remedy a solution for a problem they have. You know, a lot of folks, I talk a lot about the merchandising side of our business, but then there are the opportunities that we call professional services. So if you're providing a service, you need to do more than provide a service. It needs to be solution-based. And the way you do that is by researching the company's pain points. They talk about them all the time. They're in your ESG reports, they're in your corporate annual reports. And for most companies, like my former company, you're in the you're a soundbite in the news, you know, sixty thousand times a month. And so the story is there, but you just have to be willing to put in the time so that you can pull all of that together and figure out what the best proposal is for that particular customer or business that you're pursuing. Yeah, I think you know, in order for founders to be prepared and. Uh, for, for, for meetings, pitches, whatever have you, is that, you know, know the business that you're entering in, you know, know the category. Uh, do you have your manufacturing lined up? Do you have your packaging? Is there a, a point of differentiation in your product? Because there are a lot of Me Too products. A lot of folks wake up and, you know, you, have, you want to create something, but it's, it's like the other 72 SKUs that would be in the same category. So differentiation is certainly something that you want to do. But as I mentioned, uh, manufacturing, distribution, uh, the infrastructure to necessarily serve a customer. So, you know, in a lot of cases, like my former employee, you know, if you had a hundred stores, that's pretty big. But imagine having a thousand stores. And so then you have to have, you know, how many pieces need to be made? How many cases should I be shipping? Who's shipping those cases? Will they arrive on time at the distribution center? And then, uh, you know, how do I, you know, stay on top of making sure that that inventory is moving? And so there's a lot of preparation that one needs to, you know, do in advance of, you know, working with the corporation, but then also 
uh, maintaining that relationship. And, and it all begins and ends with the customer at the end of the day. Because I think if you keep the customer in mind, it shouldn't be transactional with the corporation. At the forefront should always be the customer. And if you're always thinking about how the customer thinks, shops, uh, engages with the customer or uh, the retailer that you're working with, then that'll always keep you uh, sort of on par with asking the questions and you know preparing and making sure that your infrastructure is solid enough to deliver without disruption. You know, when I think about, you know, competitiveness and those markets that might be saturated, again, it, it, it comes down to differentiation. Um, I think that's critical. And then just being, you know, on top of innovation because, you know, things don't stay the same. And so innovation is critically important, that be it packaging, ingredients, where is the customer today? Uh, what is she looking for? Is it a clean label? Is it a simple message? Are you... Uh, focusing on the attributes of your product and are they clearly communicated? Those are the things that will help an entrepreneur stay ahead because many of the folks that you're selling to, while they have a lot of data and information, but what I've found is like a lot of them, the entrepreneurs have built their businesses on the back of a specific community. And so staying connected to that gives you an advantage as well because it helps the uh, corporation stay on tack as well. There is data and then there's emotional connection. And that's where I feel like the entrepreneurs have the advantage if they use it properly and if they truly, truly begin to become a strategic partner with a corporation, merchant, buyer. That's where I feel like you become more competitive and your business will stay intact for as many years as you like. Yeah, my culture and family background truly shaped my career because I had examples of that around me. Um, as I said, uh, my mom was single, my father lived in Florida, but my uncle and aunt uh, were just really the sort of model that I looked at. Uh, they owned their own businesses for a long time. They owned uh, brownstones in Brooklyn. They were renters. Uh, just about everything my uncle owned, it just turned into gold. He had nightclubs. I mean, mind you, back in those days, I wasn't supposed to be in a nightclub, but I was actually collecting money at the door. But I would tell you an early story was uh, my entry into retail was uh, stocking the shelves in my uncle's luncheonette uh, over my lunch hour as probably a third or fourth grader. And, uh, you know, the importance of how a customer perceives something is what my uncle instilled in me in terms of having those labels straight, writing the price on a product legibly, dusting the shelves. Uh, I did all that while I was waiting for my lunch to be prepared at, the, at his luncheonette. And so uh, that persists on through my teen years as well as he opened up clubs and things of that nature and even um, as a, a landlord where I was collecting rent, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. So uh, that spirit was there. But then growing up in the community in which I did, there were a lot of black and brown entrepreneurs. And, and, and a lot of men, there were some women as well, um, but they were all respected people. They had empathy for the folks who patronized their businesses. And along those days, they extended credit, they cashed checks, they did a lot of things to keep the dollar in the community. And so seeing that um, was one vision. And then, you know, there was the uh, seeing yourself in a magazine with a suit, sitting in an office, uh, could I do that? Would that be possible for me as a young person sitting in Brooklyn when you hear so much uh, negativity about young men? But I had the vision to believe that I could. And, uh, and you know, that's really what's forged my career into corporate America. Just the, the, the opportunity to have a suit on and sit in an office and lead people. Uh, and that's what I ultimately became with an entrepreneurial twist, if you will. Yeah, I would say that the code that I would say that I would use to help me in my business, in my life, has been authenticity. Um, being myself, uh, showing up as I am. Um, 
you know, growing up, that's something you had to be consistent with uh, back in Brooklyn. So you don't change. People size you up, if you will, by what they see and how you walk and how you handle yourself and how you show up in rooms. And so I just carry that all the way through. I'm, now, mind you, um, I'm always respectful and diplomatic, uh, but I always remind people I can go Brooklyn if need be.